To my understanding, there was a total of 29 bodies or 28 bodies. Mm -hmm. I feel bad about killing the first person I killed in Vietnam. I see them just as vividly, just as clear. One was under the garage, so that, that makes a total of 29. Okay. Uh, December 22nd, 1978 is when I was arrested. You're going to be dead in two days. Yeah. Have I you, am. Have you processed that? I mean, as much as... Did that arrest your phone? Uh, December 22nd, 1978 is when I was arrested. Number three, Billy Wayne Coble. A Vietnam vet and an electrician by profession, Billy Wayne Coble had married Karen Visha in the summer of 1988. Both had been head over heels in love and Billy had had great expectations from a third marriage. But his optimism took a dive and he was soon having marital problems and separated from his wife, not long before the slayings. Do you regret what you did that day? Do you understand and feel the horror? I accepted I did the murders, yes. I accepted that I'm here for those. Do you feel bad about what you did? Well, I feel bad about the murder of Bobby and his parents. Yes, I feel bad that I uh, feel bad about killing the first person I killed in Vietnam. I see them just as vividly, just as clear. Coble had kidnapped Karen Visha at knife point. He had attempted to convince her not to divorce him but eventually had released her unharmed. Several weeks later, Coble was seen driving around the area where Karen Visha and her parents had lived. Drunk on power, Coble had driven around the small town of Axtell in central Texas in search of his estranged wife, Karen, who had threatened to divorce him. Whilst he couldn't find Karen, he did find her mother, Zelda Walling Visha, father Robert Joseph Visha, and brother John Robert Visha. Reports filed after his arrest detail how he shot them in their home. Coble later found Karen and kidnapped her at gunpoint after handcuffing her three children and their cousin to a bed. Death. Who is not going to leave this world? Aren't we all? Did you love your wife, Karen? We all have emotions. Mm. And there's many different... As I did the day that it happened. But I can never go back and change that. ...way with Karen in a car, but was pursued by the police, who arrested him when his car crashed. Despite sustaining knife wounds from where Coble had attacked her with a knife, Karen had survived. Whilst Coble was in hospital receiving treatment for car crash injuries, he is believed to have told various members of hospital staff that he had taken the lives of three people. Since his capture and arrest in 1990, Coble remained in prison and was put on the ending row in the same year. However, in 2007, the gallow sentence against him was overturned and he was awarded a new trial. At the retrial, a year later in 2008, the jury again sentenced him to the gallows. Coble spent nearly 30 years on the infamous ending row of his run from fate after the August 1989 shootings. Finally meeting with his maker on February 28, he became the oldest inmate executed by Texas since the state resumed carrying out capital punishment in 1982. Number two, Scott Dozier. Scott Dozier was born for his eyes as he decidedly took a dark path. By his mid-twenties, he was making much of his income from the production and sale of methamphetamine, during the course of which he would alternate between Nevada and Arizona, the two states in which he was convicted for the slayings which proceeded. On April 18, 2002, Jeremiah Miller met Dozier at La Concha in a motel on the Las Vegas Strip. Dozier had promised to help Miller buy ephedrine, a key ingredient in the production of methamphetamine. Miller had brought $12,000 in cash for that purpose. Upon Miller's arrival at La Concha, Dozier took his life, dismembered him, and stuffed him into a suitcase and disposed it near an apartment complex in western Las Vegas. The suitcase was discovered by a worker in the following week. You're going to be dead in two days. Yeah. Have I you, am. Have you processed that? I mean, as much as I'm thrashing, coughing. So, actually, I was going to bring that up with my mother and say, listen, just so you know, I've talked to people. I don't get it at all. Why do you think the country has turned to lethal injection as opposed to the other methods? You know, if you're murdering somebody, man, it's going to be brutal. Dozier was arrested on June 25, 2002 in Phoenix, Arizona. During a police investigation, it was revealed that Dozier went on a spending spree after he had allegedly stolen Miller's $12,000, telling his friends that he'd won the cash at a casino. Subsequently, he was also connected to the July 27, 2001 slaying of Jason Griffin Green, whose decomposed remains were found in the desert north of Phoenix. Dozier allegedly shot Green at a trailer in Carefree, Arizona, 
because Green threatened to expose Dozier's methamphetamine operation. Back for that to happen? I do. And you're cool with that? I don't care. I'm not gonna get up off that fucking table. How do you feel about the state using fentanyl to kill you? I think it's so awesome. The death penalty? No, I don't though, actually. However, I think that thinking about it because uh, I think if there's a wrong that needs killing, you know, I mean, if that's the answer to it, somebody killed somebody I love, and I was sure they did it. I mean, like, someone raped your sister, the only thing you do is bail that person out of jail. Dozier received a 22-year sentence in 2005 for Green's demise. After being extradited to Nevada, he stood trial for Miller's slaying. He was convicted in September 2007 and received a penalty sentence on October 3, 2007, which was upheld by the Nevada Supreme Court on January 23, 2012. His execution was delayed by several years due to litigation by pharmaceutical companies against the use of their drugs and the execution of penalty sentences. He remains to be one of the few row inmates who had requested the state authorities in his own writing to act on their execution orders. Dozier had been on self-hurt watch for several months. According to his lawyers, his mental state had deteriorated due to deprivation of personal belongings and outside contact. On January 5, 2019, Dozier was found lifeless in his penalty row cell by prison officials, having hanged himself from a bedsheet attached to an air vent in the cell. He was pronounced lifeless at 1635. Dozier was 48 years old at the time of his passing. Number 1. John Wayne Gacy John Wayne Gacy was born on March 17, 1942, the second child. Gacy was close to his mother and two sisters, but endured a difficult relationship with his father, an alcoholic who was physically hurtful to his family. One of Gacy's earliest memories was of his father beating him with a leather belt for accidentally disarranging components of a car engine he had assembled. His mother tried to shield her son from his father's axe, but to no avail. Despite this mistreatment, however, Gacy still loved his father, but felt he was never good enough in his father's eyes. By 1949, Gacy was able to come into his own and build a life for himself with the new addition to his life, Marilyn. After a six-month courtship, Gacy and Myers married in September 1964. Marilyn's father subsequently purchased three Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurants in Waterloo, Iowa. The happy couple moved into their new home, where he opened a club in his basement, where his employees could drink alcohol and play pool. These premises later became the site of many incidents of hurtful acts. Way in the back of the house, in the rec room, on the telephone. When they walked, finally walked, walked around the side of the house, on the police station. Okay, well, I didn't have time because I was doing work for the county and, and stuff like that. I started doing painting and then I started doing wallpapering and decorating. And inside of three years, 1974 became a corporation. And then I owned PDM Contractors Corporation. I owned statement of the police department. And from that date forward, mm -hmm. uh, they were had me under. He had formed a strong foundation for himself and felt confident in acting on his latent tendencies which he had kept hidden up till this point. Soon he was playing out his compulsions on young teenage boys, scamming them into acting on receiving his attention. Soon Gacy came into the notice of law enforcement agencies and he was brought in for questioning. While charges were brought against him, Gacy employed criminal means to subdue the witnesses, but once again he was caught out in his dastardly designs. His psych evaluation marked him as a sociopath with psychotic tendencies with no hope for rehabilitation. Gacy was convicted and imprisoned for 10 years for the attack on teenager Voorhees. Gacy's wife petitioned for divorce and took the entire property as well as sole custody of their kids. He never saw his family ever again. Thus came the end to Gacy's story of survival and started his descent into crime. It was the beginning of his journey down a dark and evil path. His descent down the rabbit hole began in 1970 when he was released from prison after serving 18 months of his 10-year sentence. By 1971, he was once again behind bars facing charges of attacking a teenage boy yet again. With financial assistance from his mother, Gacy bought a ranch house near the village of Norwich Witch he used as his slaying field. For many months to come, Gacy used his residence to throw opulent parties, entertaining the rich and influential under his roof. He even made an attempt at normality by marrying once again, but it turned out it was only a ruse to throw any suspicion off his scent and ended in a premature divorce. In their time together, his second wife had observed the comings and goings of young boys and come across their belongings quite frequently. In 1979, Gacy had a flourishing career as he worked for PDM in interior design, remodeling, 
installation, assembly, and landscaping. Through his membership in a local moose club, Casey became aware of a Jolly Joker Clown Club in which he joined in late 1975 and created his own clown characters Pogo the Clown and Patches the Clown, devising his own makeup and costumes. That's where he birthed his alter egos, who accompanied him on a spree of crime, unlike the world had ever seen before. Gacy was unraveling fast, and the only thing which kept him from landing behind bars was that his victims were men. He had no control over his impulses, and all that mattered was that he got the satisfaction of acting on his sick fantasies no matter what. By the time his criminal career was brought to an end, he had snuffed out 33 souls. Uh, and that same day, they held me there at, for nine hours, and while holding me there for nine hours, they surveillance. The only trouble is, is that the, the Mickey Mouse way they were doing it, they had two cars following me day and night. To my understanding, there was a total of 29 bodies, or 28 bodies, mm -hmm. where finally one was under the garage. So that, that makes a total of 29. Okay. Now, uh, uh, from the standpoint of the arrest, when you did that arrest, do you recall? Uh, December 22nd, 1978 is when I was arrested. February 6, 1980, charged with 33 slayings. His lawyers opted to have Gacy plead not guilty by reason of insanity to the charges against him. Presenting Gacy as a Jekyll and Hyde character, the defense produced several psychiatric experts who had examined Gacy. But the testimonies against him started piling up and his accusers started pouring out of the woodwork. John Gacy's long criminal career was about to come to an end, and his criminal tendencies had provided him with the rope to use as a noose against his own neck. At his final hearing, the jury deliberated for a measly one and a half hours before it passed a guilty verdict, convicting him of the crimes he was facing. At the time of his conviction for 33 slayings, it was the highest count which any person in U.S. history had ever been convicted of. That's all for this video, folks. We will see you another time.